On October 8, 1988, a tragic incident occurred at 16 Woodland Way in Greenville, South Carolina. Alice Hainsworth Ryan, a lung cancer patient who had recently completed a three-day chemotherapy session, was found deceased in her kitchen. She had sustained multiple stab wounds. The distressing discovery was made by her daughter, Catherine Stribling, who noticed a shattered window pane near the back door, indicating that something was wrong. This heart-wrenching scene raised numerous inquiries. Who could be responsible for such a horrendous act? What motivated this inhumane crime? Greenville, South Carolina, a vibrant city with a population of over 70,000 according to the 2020 census, is renowned for its rich history and thriving art scene. It is a place where the charm of the past harmonizes with modern living, offering a plethora of recreational and historical sites. The community, known for its friendliness and diversity, contributes to a lively and welcoming atmosphere. Greenville stands out for its blend of urban conveniences and natural beauty, making it an attractive destination for both residents and visitors. However, like any city, Greenville faces its share of challenges, including a crime rate that is 81.53% higher than the national average. The resolution of the Alice Hainsworth Ryan cold case serves as a reminder of the city's ongoing efforts to address these issues. Alice Hainsworth Ryan, born into a prominent family on January 24, 1908, grew up in a world of privilege and prominence in Greenville. Her upbringing on Main Street, under the care of her father, Harry J. Hainsworth, and mother, Rhoda Livingston Hainsworth, profoundly influenced her life. Alice had an extensive network of connections. She was the sister of mill owner H.J. Hainsworth, Jr., and had ties to notable figures such as Judge Clement Hainsworth and Greenville's mayor, Knox White. At the age of 80, Alice was a widow after her husband, Joseph Murray Ryan, passed away in 1950 when she was only 42 years old. Despite this loss, she remained a central figure in Greenville society, navigating much of her life alone. Alice's life was deeply intertwined with the city's history, as she had spent her entire married life in the Grand Woodland Way home near Cleveland Park. This was the very place where her life came to a tragic end. A mother of three, Alice was known for her active participation in social events. She was a familiar face at civic gatherings, an alumna of Converse College, and a member of the Greenville Country Club. Despite her affluent lifestyle, she preferred simplicity in her home life. Surprisingly, she opted not to have air conditioning installed, a decision that occasionally concerned her family, who also worried about the lack of security systems. However, those who were acquainted with her described her as a fearless individual. In late 1987, Alice was confronted with a new challenge, a diagnosis of lung cancer following a battle with pneumonia. She fought bravely against the illness until her unfortunate passing, enduring chemotherapy and its toll on her health. Her life, filled with connections and history, came to a tragic end in the place she had called home for so many years, leaving the community in shock and her family grappling with a profound loss. On that fateful Saturday, on October 8, 1988, Greenville experienced a clear sky, a departure from the usual humid haze of the southern summer. For 80-year-old Alice Ryan, this day brought a sense of relief as she left St. Francis Hospital after a challenging two-night stay for her chemotherapy. Little did anyone know that it would be her final day. Alice's daughter, Catherine Stribling, had a routine plan for the day. She dropped her mother off at home around 2 p.m. after the hospital visit and then went out to get lunch for both of them. However, upon her return at 3.10 p.m., she was met with a disturbing sight. As she approached the back door of her mother's house, she noticed something alarming. The pane near the doorknob was shattered. Puzzled and perhaps a bit anxious, Catherine inserted her key and opened the door without even checking if it was locked. The scene that awaited her in the kitchen was both horrifying and surreal. The stillness of the room was broken by the sight of Alice, Catherine's mother, lying motionless on the floor. The peaceful atmosphere of their home was shattered, much like the broken window. 
Catherine's gaze was immediately drawn to the white silk turban, now stained with blood and a few feet away from her mother, leaving her bald head exposed, a stark reminder of her battle with cancer. Adding to the horror, Alice's brown trousers remained undisturbed, while her pink turtleneck and brown sweater were in disarray, revealing numerous dark, ominous wounds on her abdomen. What started as a tranquil morning had quickly turned into a nightmare. The calmness of a mother returning home after treatment was brutally disrupted by a violent act, plunging a family into mourning and a community into disbelief. The discovery of Alice Hainsworth Ryan's lifeless body was not only a heartbreaking moment for her loved ones, but also a shocking event for the entire Greenville community. It marked the beginning of a perplexing unsolved case, a cold mystery that would haunt the city for years to come. The finding of Alice Hainsworth Ryan's body in her Greenville residence triggered a thorough and intense investigation by the local authorities. Upon arrival, the police immediately began probing into the details of this heinous crime. A crucial lead emerged when a black and yellow-handled flathead screwdriver, suspected to be the murder weapon, was located in a nearby ravine, close to where an abandoned car was also discovered. Intriguingly, the screwdriver yielded no fingerprints, complicating the investigative process. Furthermore, a blood-stained dish towel similar to others found in Mrs. Ryan's kitchen, was unearthed, adding another layer of mystery to the case. The autopsy findings painted a grim picture. Alice Ryan, already weakened by her chemotherapy, displayed no signs of defensive wounds. There were no traces of hair or skin under her fingernails, indicating she had not put up a fight. She had succumbed to four fatal stab wounds to her back and abdomen, yet her body bore a total of 37 stab wounds. The brutality of the attack left the community reeling in shock and fear. The murder caused a sense of unease to spread throughout the neighborhood, prompting residents to take extra precautions. There was a sudden increase in calls to burglar alarm companies as people became more vigilant about strangers and made it a routine to double-check locked doors. A crucial eyewitness account came from a 16-year-old girl who lived half a mile away from Mrs. Ryan's house. She attended Christchurch Episcopal School and reported seeing a white car speeding in reverse down Mrs. Ryan's driveway around the time of the murder. The car in police custody was recognized by her as the one she had almost collided with. Although she couldn't provide a detailed description of the driver, she remembered noticing dark hair. The investigation into Alice Ryan's murder became one of the largest in Greenville's history. The Greenville Police Department, along with state law enforcement division agents and an FBI agent, worked tirelessly on the case. They meticulously created a detailed profile of the potential perpetrator and interviewed approximately 300 individuals, including around 60 potential suspects. The evidence collected was extensive, consisting of two large cardboard boxes filled with incident reports, tape recordings, interview notes, and crime scene photos. The investigators were well aware of Alice Ryan's high-profile status as the widow of a wealthy textile executive and a member of one of Greenville's most prominent legal families. Additionally, Alice's family publicly offered a $10,000 reward for anyone who could provide information leading to the killer's identification. Despite the extensive investigation and pursued leads, every avenue explored ultimately reached a dead end. The case eventually went cold for several decades. However, in 2017, a breakthrough occurred, offering a glimmer of hope in the long-standing mystery surrounding the chilling murder of Alice Hainsworth Ryan. The persistence of the investigators led them to re-examine the evidence using fresh eyes and advanced technology. Their dedication paid off when they uncovered DNA evidence on one of the items initially gathered from the crime scene. This vital piece of evidence, belonging to an African-American male, had been carefully preserved over the years, awaiting advancements in forensic science. In November of 2017, the investigators submitted this DNA sample to the Combined DNA Index System. The relentless efforts of the law enforcement team were finally rewarded when they received notification of a match in the Combined DNA Index System database to a DNA profile, 
This was the breakthrough they had been eagerly anticipating, a major lead in a case that had remained unsolved for almost 30 years. The DNA profile led them to a 50-year-old man residing in Americus, Georgia. Further investigations and DNA testing confirmed his identity as Brian Keith Munns. This discovery marked a significant turning point in the investigation, transforming it from a cold case to a case with a concrete suspect. Born in 1968, Brian Keith Munns had a background that was largely unknown in terms of family details. However, his criminal record painted a troubling picture. In 1998, Munns faced charges for first-degree criminal sexual conduct. He ultimately pleaded guilty in 2001, resulting in a period of imprisonment that lasted until May of 2007. Upon his release, he was placed on probation, but this period of relative freedom was short-lived. Munns found himself back in prison in August of 2008 after his community supervision was revoked. Released on probation again in May of 2009, his freedom was once again short-lived. He violated the terms of his release by failing to register as a sex offender, leading to his community supervision being revoked once more in July of 2009. Munns completed his sentence and was released in October of 2009. This pattern of incarceration and release, coupled with the severity of his crimes, highlights a troubled history. On May 6, 2019, the Greenville Police Department made a significant announcement. Brian Keith Munns, who was 51 years old at the time and lived in Americus, Georgia, was apprehended in connection with the long-standing murder case of Alice Hainsworth Ryan. Greenville Police Chief Ken Miller disclosed that Munns had been taken into custody on February 15th, but this information was deliberately withheld to allow for further probing and interviews. Chief Miller justified the delayed announcement by stating that premature disclosure of Munns's arrest could have compromised the investigation, potentially impeding detectives' efforts to validate witness testimonies and gather more evidence. Subsequent to Munns's apprehension, detectives conducted an additional 30 interviews, which played a pivotal role in reconstructing the events leading to Ryan's demise. Notably, one of these interviews, provided by an acquaintance of Munns, offered detailed insights into the crime, shedding light on Munns's entry into Ryan's residence, the nature of the inflicted injuries, and the chronological sequence of events. This crucial information led to the filing of supplementary charges against Munns. The culmination of a meticulous 29-month reinvestigation involving the Cold Case Unit, active detectives, and a state law enforcement division agent resulted in Munns's arrest. Chief Miller commended the dedication and hard work of all parties involved, including prosecutors who ensured that the case was handled in a manner conducive to successful prosecution. However, a new development emerged following Munz's arrest. He confessed to being present in Ryan's vehicle with Lamar Green on the day of the murder. Munz shifted the blame onto Green, alleging that Green was the one responsible for Ryan's death and attempted to sell him the car afterward. Interestingly, Lamar Green had been a suspect from the outset, but was killed in an incident deemed justifiable homicide, effectively closing his chapter in the investigation. Despite the initial charges, Munns eventually pleaded guilty to the offense of failing to report the crime to law enforcement. In September 2021, he received a four-year sentence, with credit for time served, and the remaining charges were dismissed. After a prolonged period of uncertainty and sorrow, Alice Hainsworth Ryan's family was able to find some semblance of closure regarding her tragic passing. In her own bedroom, a woman was discovered dead. Her two sons, who shared the same home, saw and heard nothing. Detectives began their investigation, but they were unable to identify the offender. No one was ready for the truth that came to light, even though it took 38 years for the case to make progress. Linda Slayton was born in 1950 in Alabama, United States. She was raised by devoted parents and had a younger sister named Judy. Linda was kind-hearted and ambitious from a young age. She made a lot of friends by constantly attempting to assist others. She later wed Frank, 
and the two of them had two sons, Jeff and Tim. But as time passed, their marriage grew more and more troubled. Frank began abusing his wife and kids after becoming addicted to alcohol. Linda ultimately made the decision to relocate to Florida with her sons. They made their home in Lakeland, where Linda's sister and parents were already residing. Setting aside all of her time to support her sons, Linda rented a home in a lakeside community. Linda worked at a number of jobs, but she was never wealthy. She occasionally had to sell her possessions in order to pay her bills. Because she could not even afford a car, Jeff, her older son, had to commute by bicycle. Tim, her younger son, was a football player and frequently had to ask his coach for a lift home from practice in order to avoid having to walk. Linda made it her mission to spend as much time and energy as possible with her sons, even in the face of financial hardship. She tried to make sure their childhood was full of happy memories by taking them on walks, taking them to concerts of their favorite bands, and so on. When Linda was 31 years old, on September 3, 1981, in the evening, she waited for Tim to get done with his practice before accompanying him to the neighbor's small family celebration. When Jeff got home, he wanted to have dinner, but the refrigerator was empty. After becoming enraged with his mother, he rode his bicycle to his grandparents' residence on the opposite side of town. After the entire family got home, Jeff got into a fight with his mother about the empty refrigerator, but in the end, they said goodnight to one another and went to bed. The next morning, Linda received a visit from her sister, who also lived in the same complex, inviting her over for coffee. When she knocked on the door, nobody answered. Thinking Linda had gone somewhere, the woman turned around to leave when she noticed the bedroom window was open. When she went to look inside, she saw Linda lying on the other side of the bed. The woman screamed and ran to the neighbors to report what she had seen immediately. She only needed to take one glance at her sister's face to know that she was dead. When detectives got to their home, they started looking over the scene of the crime. With a wire hanger around her neck and her clothes half down, Linda lay on her bed. Based on the evidence, the police surmised that the victim had been attacked and strangled by an unidentified man who had entered her room. Soon after, forensic specialists discovered a palm print on the windowsill, supporting this theory. Since the apartment lacked air conditioning, Linda frequently left it open, which allowed the murderer easy access. The victim's oldest son woke up from all the noise while the detectives were at the crime scene. After escorting him outside, the detectives broke the devastating news of his mother's passing. They woke up his younger brother later and escorted him out. But as the boy was passing by his mother's room, a second policeman came out, and Tim saw his mother's body through the open door. He instantly froze, and the officer had to pull him away. Tim, who was 12, and Jeff, who was 15, were completely shocked. At first, they were unable to accept their mother's death. When the investigators were able to speak with the brother later, he said they had not heard anything or even woken up that night. The detectives thought this was odd, even though they had their own rooms. Given the brutality of the murder and the excellent acoustics of the building, loud noises ought to have been audible from the victim's room. The neighbors were questioned by the police, but they had also heard nothing. That day, none of the complex's occupants had seen any suspicious people. After examining the victim's body, medical professionals concluded that she had been abused. Although they were able to remove the murderer's biological material, DNA analysis was not yet possible. The experts verified that Linda's death was due to strangulation. Therefore, the investigators were left with very little evidence to work with. They could only benefit from the palm print if they could locate a suspect and compare them. Linda's sons went to live with their grandparents. They continued to live in shock and continual fear of being pursued by the unidentified killer. Because of the extreme fear, their grandfather sat with a rifle in the living room while they slept in the same room as their grandmother. The investigators thought the kids were not in danger, though. They believed that the killer had to have known the victim and that the crime was motivated only by sexual desire. Following their conversation with Linda's family, 
they discovered that her ex-husband had a violent past. He was the top suspect right away, but the police soon discovered that the man was not there when the murder happened. Investigators later learned that Linda had begun dating a particular man not long before she passed away. They were able to track him down, but he also had a strong alibi. The fingerprints of all the victim's neighbors were compared by the detectives with the sample found on the windowsill. They then tried the same procedure on all the men who had previously been found guilty living in Lakeland, but they were unable to find any matches. After Linda's sons began to heal over several weeks following the murder, their family finally concluded that sending them back to school would be the best course of action. It did eventually assist the brothers, as they started talking to friends once more and eventually resumed a regular life. Tim returned to the football team because his mother had always been pleased with his achievements. He put a picture of his team in his bedroom a month after she passed away as a memento of how his mother had inspired him to pursue his dreams. In the meantime, the detectives were unable to identify a viable suspect and came to a standstill. They made the decision to start over and reevaluate why the sons had not heard any screams or indications of a struggle. After going over Jeff's statements, the police discovered that on the day Linda was killed, he got into a fight with her. The teenager himself added that he and his mother had verbal arguments on a regular basis. This led the investigators to wonder if Jeff had murdered his mother. They summoned him in for questioning and once more posed a variety of queries. Jeff quickly learned that he was under suspicion from the investigators for the crime. The detectives persisted in their pressure even after he denied any involvement. Jeff accepted their offer to take a polygraph exam. Although the polygraph operator did not find any evidence of deceit, the police were not willing to give up. Not too long after, they summoned him back for interrogation and even made arrangements to have him hypnotized. Jeff was under constant pressure, and the investigators even accused him of killing his mother by strangulation. The family of Linda reached a breaking point as a result, and they forbade the police from speaking to Jeff and insisted that they concentrate on finding the true murderer. Jeff consented to take another polygraph test in spite of this, and after receiving positive results, he was at last written off as a suspect. After that, the case did not move forward for a long time. Tim and Jeff grew up, gained employment, and began their own families. Their mother's murder continued to haunt them, but each time they reached out to the investigators, they were met with the same response. Nothing had changed in the case. Scientists took a DNA sample from the biological material on the victim's body in March 1999. When a new detective was brought on to the case two years later, he compared it with samples from every suspect, including Linda's two sons, but there were no matches. There were no results even when it was compared to the FBI database. When Jeff first met this detective, he found out that he had known him for a long time. It turned out that the men and their mutual friends went bowling together on a regular basis. When they spoke, the investigator assured Jeff that he would do everything in his power to solve the case. Tim and Jeff learned of another unsolved crime that had been going on for a long time around the same period. Following extensive media coverage, fresh information surfaced that helped apprehend the offender. At that point, the brothers made the decision to talk to reporters about their family's tragedy. They conducted a thorough interview, and the local newspapers published the story. The detective received an intriguing lead in September of 2001. He discovered that a year after Linda's murder, a man by the name of Jimmy Ulmer had kidnapped a young woman through her bedroom window. He was sentenced to 80 years in prison for this crime. The fact that this individual resided in the same apartment building as Linda, only a short distance from her home, added to the intrigue at the time of her murder. Since it was non-existent at the time of Ulmer's arrest, criminals' DNA had not yet been added to a shared database. The man himself died in 1996, and no biological samples remained. But when the investigator got in touch with the offender's mother, she gave some personal items from which the specialists were able to remove the sample. Sadly, the results did not match the killer's DNA, but the investigator was not about to give up. 
He kept in touch with Linda's sons, kept looking for new suspects, and repeatedly asked the FBI to check the killer's DNA sample against every database they could find. Sadly, he had health issues in 2015, which made him retire even though he had promised to see the case through to the end. Jeff and Tim had been so close to accepting that their mother's killer would never be found by then. But when Cease Moore, a well-known genetic genealogy specialist, took up the case in 2019, new hope materialized. She obtained the murderer's DNA sample, uploaded it to open databases, and started looking for matches. Usually, these databases can even assist in locating the DNA owner's most distant relatives, who may reside in different regions of the globe and be completely unaware of one another. By using this information, one can follow their family tree, look for shared ancestors, eliminate thousands of relatives, and determine who the DNA owner is. Moore was able to identify one family that was residing in the area at the time of the murder after carrying out all of this intensive investigation. She came to the conclusion that the only member of that family who met all the criteria was the one who was most likely the murderer. He was someone the detectives had come across in previous reports as soon as they heard his name. The man was Tim's football coach, Joseph Clinton Mills, and he would often give him a lift home after practice. Although he had never been on the list of suspects, in 1981 he had given a statement over the phone to the police after dropping Tim off at home that day. The idea that Mills might be the murderer was not even entertained by any of the detectives. Since he was only 20 years old and there was no evidence at all against him at the time, the police did not compare his fingerprints and DNA to samples that were discovered at the crime scene. The investigators made the decision to withhold this discovery's disclosure from Jeff and Tim. They had to confirm that Mills was actually responsible for their mother's murder first. After reading his biography, they discovered that Mills was detained in 1984 on suspicion of forging a will. His fingerprints were obtained, and they are still preserved in a paper archive. After comparing them to the victim's windowsill fingerprints, experts discovered a perfect match. They eventually found out who the likely murderer was 38 years later. The detectives proceeded to the last phase as soon as this information was discovered, requesting a DNA sample from Mills so they could compare it with the biological material taken from the victim's body. They found out the man was still residing in the same home as he had in 1981. At this point, Mills was 58 years old, married, had a small business, and children and grandchildren. For several weeks, the detectives kept an eye on him in the hopes of obtaining something that had his DNA. It might have been a bottle, a coffee cup, a cigarette butt, or anything else. But since they were never given the chance, the cops made the covered decision to take his trash. They gave the bag to the lab where professionals quickly found an object that matched his DNA. The results came back quickly. Mills' DNA exactly matched the sample that was discovered on Linda's body. Following that, the detectives met with Linda's sons to update them on the investigation's status. While they were both taken aback, Tim found it more difficult to accept. He was shocked to learn that his football coach was the same monster that had murdered his mother. In addition to the fact that Tim looked up to and respected him, Mills still gave him rides home from practice after the murder. The man gave him unceasing encouragement and inquired about any updates regarding his mother's case. For a long time, Tim's old bedroom featured a picture of his football team, with the monster that killed his mother standing right behind them. When Mills was arrested that same year, he handled himself calmly and did not even inquire as to the nature of his charges. Upon being interrogated and questioned about Linda's murder, he denied any involvement. He said he dropped him off and headed out. Mills claimed he had never been inside their home, but the investigators knew this was untrue. The suspect abruptly altered his account of what happened after they told him about the DNA and fingerprint match. According to Mills, Linda asked him to sneak into her bedroom through the window that evening for a private conversation. She then requested that he give her a light hanger choke, but Mills misjudged his strength and killed her. The investigators, understandably, 
were skeptical of this account at first. In light of all the available data, their theory was far more likely to be correct. Mills had seen Tim's mother on multiple occasions and could have targeted her as a victim. He dropped the boy off on the night of the murder, and the boy went straight to a neighbor's house with his mother for a party. Mills drove a distance away from their house, taking advantage of the fact that no one would be home, and then he returned on foot, breaking through Linda's bedroom window and hiding in the closet. He waited for everyone to go to sleep for several hours. He took a wire hanger out of that same closet and used it as a murder weapon. He violently attacked the victim before exiting the house through the window. Mills was charged with the murder and the case was sent to court based on all the evidence that was available. For this kind of offense, Mills could have received the death penalty in the state of Florida. However, on February 9, 2022, he made the decision to reach a settlement with the prosecution in order to avoid this outcome. He admitted to the murder, but he was exempt from sharing the specifics of the crime under the terms of the agreement. This fact did not sit well with Linda's sons. Tim yelled at his coach in the courtroom, demanding to know why he had taken his mother away from him. But the man just stared down and said nothing. When given the chance to make a closing statement, Mills only said, I am a good person, I am not who they are trying to portray me as. Even though this infuriated the brothers even more, in the end, they were appreciative of the investigators for solving the case and identifying the murderer. Mills received a life sentence without the chance of release. Following the verdict's announcement, Jeff and Tim pledged to live moral lives and devote themselves to their families because they knew their mother would have approved of it.